Hi, and welcome to another uh, edition of Infrastructure for the Future. We're here today with Tyler Bender and Peter Gerritsen to talk about the intersection of geopolitics and space, uh, specifically the uh, international order that has been a bedrock of US influence since the late 1940s and how the US leadership in that system has created the world that we live in and how that system as we move into space may not be exactly what is needed and uh, may not be up to the challenge. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about what that international order looks like, what the challenges are to it from competitors and what policy options there are available to the US to be able to ensure that the, whether it's free and fair uh, democratic systems we support, the free flow of trade and economics around the world extends into space and that we're not pushed back into this mercantilist or uh, peer competitive mode that existed prior to the world wars prior to uh, the turn of the 20th century and so um, it's exciting to be able to talk to with both tyler a uh, policy analyst with Beyond Earth, uh, and Peter Gerritsen from uh, the uh, another, I mean, realistically, if you are in this space and uh, you don't know Peter Gerritsen, there's a handful of books you need to pick up. Uh, his names are on the cover, uh, but he is a analyst uh, that really, that really undersells his uh, work at the American Foreign Policy Council uh, where he focuses on space and defense. So first up, uh, we'll hear from Tyler. Tyler's a Marine Corps veteran uh, with uh, long history working in broadband telecommunications. Uh, he has a master's in international relations uh, from the Yosef Gorbel School uh, at University of Denver, uh, where he looked at the intersection of US foreign policy and global economics. Tyler's a former independent candidate for US Congress, where among other things, he advocated for uh, ending the partisan gridlock uh, and reinforcing US leadership in the effort to expand uh, humanity's presence in outer space. So we're excited to have you here, Tyler. Uh, the screen is yours. All right, Sam, thanks for having me. Uh, also, thanks for the invitation to speak on two topics I'm passionate about which is U.S. global leadership and outer space. I'm going to share my screen here. All right, so the U.S.-led international order, why we made it and how it relates to space. So before we get too far into things, I should explain what I mean when I say the U.S.-led international order. So also called the post-World War II international order, the liberal international order or the rules-based international order. And this is my definition. I define the liberal US-led international order as a loose collection of internationally accepted norms and institutions established by the United States and its allies at the end of World War II, which espouses liberal values of state sovereignty, cooperation between nation states, democracy, human rights, free markets, free trade, and the rule of law, all underpinned by the social and cultural influence of the, of the West, the strength of the US economy and the US dollar, and the military power of the United States and its vast system of military alliances. Now to understand why the United States made the international order, you need to understand the context that led to its creation. Um, so we're gonna rewind to the late 19th, early 20th centuries, a period that was characterized by the waning of British power and constant economic and political instability. So the economic order at the time was based on the gold standard led by the British, but it was quickly fracturing. But at the same time, you still had a strict adherence to the gold standard and was being prioritized over social stability. So you had falling wages, rising prices for goods, rising unemployment, rising inequality and economic dis disruption, such as the Panic of 1873, which was a global depression that lasted for 20 years in the United Kingdom. And this economic dis 
This economic instability led to rising populism and rejection of globalization as it, as it existed at the time. In addition, you had little, little political order at the international level. So the United States, although it was a rising power, remained isolationist, partly because it had economic problems of its own, with 10 recessions between 1873 and 1913. And you also had Europe constantly at war, with at least 17 conflicts on the continent within the 19th century alone. And this all led to an unstable balance of power and the, where the assassination, assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914 set off a diplomatic disaster that eventually led to World War I. So Austria and Hungary wanted to invade Serbia in retaliation for the assassination because they blamed Ser Serbia. Germany feared that Russia would mobilize in response to Austria's invasion of Serbia, so they attacked France in hopes of a swift victory, but then the British became involved and thus began World War I, which was essentially a four-year stalemate that was broken only by the entry of the United States in 1917 and resulted in 18 million dead with 20 million wounded in a new era of warfare, where you had mass mobilization of popular armies with, with modern weaponry. Then followed the interwar years, which continued political, econo economic, and political instability. So the Treaty of Versailles, formally ended the war on June 28th, 1919, five years to the day after France Ferdinand was assassinated, but it failed to restore the international order. Mostly because although the ostensible goal of the Treaty of Versailles was a return of peace, the explicit goal of the, of the French in signing the treaty was pain for Germany. And this was not helpful. At the same time, you had America returning to isolationism by refusing to join the League of Nations, even though it was kind of our idea. And at the same time, you had rising inequality and economic dis disruption, most notably, the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression of 1929 to 1939. So once again, you had economic instability leading, leading to rising populism and rejection of globalization. And we saw the rise of socialism on the left and the rise of fascism on the right in its most extreme form in Nazi Germany, where Hitler rose to power and eventually invaded Poland in 1939 to begin World War II. World War, World War II was once again a European conflict that the isolationist United States tried to stay out of, but was drawn in, of course, with the attacks on Pearl Harbor. And by the end of the war in 1945, the world had seen 60 million dead, 45 million of which were civilians, and another 25 million people wounded. Then finally learning lessons of the past, the United States began working with its allies, primarily the United Kingdom, before World War II even ended, to establish a framework for international stability. And this included economic institu institutions, most notably, most notably those created by the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, which created the International Monetary Fund, which provides short-term lending for economic crises, the World Bank, which provides longer-term lending for development in low-income states, and the Global Agre Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, which is now the World Trade Organization, which encourages multilateral co cooperation to expand trade, resolve trade disputes, and reduce protectionism. Now, these economic institutions are all part of what the economist John Rugger referred to as the embedded liberal compromise, where you, see, where you still see a commitment to free markets, but at the same time, states maintain a broader commitment to social welfare and full unemployment. And in, in addition to these economic institutions, we also have political institutions, such as the consensus building abilities of the United States, the United States alliance system, and the United States military power, and, all, and of course, the United Nations, which was created in 1945, with purposes that include maintaining international peace and security, and achieving international cooperation and solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character. Now, as in the past, the United States does not lead the international order wholly out of enlightened self-interest. There were strategic, strategic considerations in creating the post-World War II international order, such as our interest in balancing against Soviet power and the spread of communism. But the order remains intact after 75 years and has had many successes. One of those, of course, being the victory in the Cold War, which brought the end of, the to which brought the end of totalitarianism with the fall of the Soviet Union. And despite the Cold War, there's, there was also has been an absence of great power warfare for the past 75 years, which is unprecedented in world history. We've also seen, which, which, which contributes to a historical reduction in global conflict deaths over time. We've also seen a growth of democracy, whereas in 1945, 30% of governments were democratic, close to 60% are democratic today, although this, is, this has backslid in recent years. Um, but this, this increasing stability has led to economic growth. So we've seen global GDP rise from 9.25 trillion in 1950 to over 100 trillion in 2015. 
and this contributed to a de decrease in global poverty, where 1 billion people have been brought out of extreme poverty since 1990. And to break up the monotony of my slides, I'm going to bring in some visual aids just to, to really bring the numbers home. So, so World War II had 60 million dead, all told, and that's the degrees decreased significantly since then. So, of course, we had the Korean War, many casualties there, Vietnam War, casualties there, the Iran Iraq War in the 1980s, but we've seen a, a gradual decline in that time, even despite conflicts in the Middle East that continue today, such as in Syria and Yemen. But overall, conflict-related deaths have dropped significantly. And then just to give a, bring the point home of the exponential growth of the global economy, um, you see global GDP really unchanged until a few decades before 1950. It's really, it's really escalated significantly since then, all, all because of the global, globalized economy. But although the international order has, has had successes, it is also facing threats. We could go back as far as the 1970s to address these threats, but I'm going to stick with the 21st century. Starting with the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which violated state sovereignty, which is a fundamental principle of the international order, disregarded the United Nations, and unilaterally imposed democracy, all four weapons of mass destruction that we found were not even there. Then you had the 2008 global financial crisis, which originated in the United States with the collapse of our housing bubble, but quickly spread to a global recession. And this was seen as a neglect of our resp financial responsibility as the most important economy in the world. Then you also have unequal gains from globalization. And this is where we see, we've seen a neglect of the embedded liberal compromise and return to prioritizing the market over society. So although we've had more global trade and investment, we've seen little help with the adjustment costs of economic change, such as jobs lost, automation, and trade. And this had a real impact on wages. So although US GDP per capita has risen from 28,000 in 1980 to 56,000 today, and this is in 2010 dollars, in that same time, the median wage for men has fallen by 6%. We've also seen rising equality across countries in the West, including countries such as egalitarian Sweden. And as seen in the past, economic disruption has led to rising populism and rejection of globalization. So we've seen a recurring pattern here. Another threat to the international order is our withdrawal from the Iran nuclear agreement and our withdrawal from Afghanistan. So in abandoning the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, that did nothing to slow Iran's progress towards obtaining a nuclear weapon. And for them to do so would, of course, make the Middle East even more unstable than it is today. And our 20 year state building adventure ended with the Taliban re returning right back to power. Um, now both, both withdrawals damage the credibility of the United States and signal to our allies and our adversaries that the United States could abandon its commitment at any, any time it chooses without any regard for the consequences. We all, another threat to the international order is the, the tension between state sovereignty and human rights. So in the case of, of China, the Uyghurs, for example, um, China has sovereignty over what, what happens with its domestic, domestic affairs, but when those domestic affairs impede on people's human rights, what do you, what do, you do? There's just constant tension there. And finally, um, what I think is the biggest threat to the US-led international order is political dysfunction in the United States. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the politics of this, but I think it's safe to say that the United States is not providing a very good example as the leader of the free world. And that brings us to outer space, which I see as a new frontier to revive the US leadership and the international order. And yes, there are problems on earth, but space is a domain where I see we can utilize we can utilize to address those problems. One example being climate change, where monitoring weather patterns and tracking progress in reducing carbon emissions relies on satellites that are orbiting the planet as we speak. Um, and enabling growth, so enabling growth of the space economy creates new, new markets, which creates new jobs. And in the case of the space economy, we're talking high skill, high paying jobs because building satellites, building robots that are operate on the, on the lunar surface that requires high school to build those kinds of things. And just like global trade across the seas where safe passage is guaranteed by the United States, the space economy requires predictability and stability. And this requires establishing responsible norms of behavior. And the United States has already taken steps in this direction, such as the tenets of responsible behavior that were, that were, that were released by the DOD in July. 
Um, we also need to address space traffic management and orbital debris mitigation of space with space becoming quickly more and more congested. Um, and the United States has also taken steps in this, dire this direction with, with plans to move at least civil space traffic management to the Department of Commerce, but progress in this area has been slow, although it is, there are some steps in that direction. Um, and finally, space is an opportunity to continue and expand international cooperation. For example, the International Space Station, where we have cooperated with Russia for nearly 20 years, despite our many, many disagreements on the surface of the Earth. But we need to, talk, we need to start talking about what comes after the International Space Station. It is getting old. Um, there are hopes to, to maintain its operation until 2030, 2024 at the latest, but we need to start talking about what comes after that as far as the commercial side. What commercial companies, I know there are plans in progress, but um, we need to guarantee that there's a commercial option before we retire the ISS. So we have a presence in low earth orbit. And then finally, we have the Artemis Accords, where the United States is using its consensus building abilities to draw in international partners and lunar activities that it will be in accordance with the principles of the Outer Space Treaty. And the Artemis program, to establish a peaceful and sustainable presence on the lunar surface is noteworthy. But we have to make it back to the moon in a timely manner, and we need to stick with the, pan, the, stick with the plan or we risk being passed up by China and Russia with their own plans for an international lunar research station. And that's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Tyler, that was, uh, that was a great overview of sort of how we've gotten to where we're at um, and what, what that's looked like over the past hundred years. I know many of us, uh, when we look out across the world, we don't necessarily uh, associate institutions like International Monetary Fund, World Bank, with these pillars of a system that has preserved peace and stability um, for an unprecedented amount of time. Um, we, we tend to look at the Iraq war, Afghanistan, and other small conflicts and think war is all over the place. It happens all the time, but you know, it's been the better part of a hundred years since a major power conflict. Um, and that's in no small part because of this system that was put in place uh, at the end of uh, World War II. So uh, thank you for that. I now wanna to turn to uh, Peter. Uh, Peter is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a senior fellow uh, in defense studies at the American Foreign Policy Council and a strategy consultant who focuses on the intersection of space and defense. Uh, he's the co-author of Scramble for the Skies, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space. And he hosts uh, the American Foreign Policy Council's Space Strategy Podcast. We'll have the links to both of those put uh, in the description for this video so you all uh, can see them. I encourage you to check them both out. Uh, by foundational reading uh, on the part of the book and the podcast uh, is uh, an amazing insight into how uh, decision makers are thinking throughout uh, government when it comes to space strategy. Uh, prior to joining AFPC, uh, Peter Gerritsen was a colonel in the Air Force uh, with a long history of strategy and policy advising. I uh, won't list all of uh, his accomplishments because we only have a finite amount of time, but uh, he has been either the lead author or a uh, key contributor on a number of strategic documents, including the 2011 National Military Strategy, the first Air Force uh, Unmanned Aerial System Flight Plan, Directed Energy Task Force, DARPA 100-year uh, Starship, Pentagon Study on Space Solar Power. It goes on and on. Um, short version, Peter is an accomplished policy author uh, with an eye towards space and the challenges the U.S. faces. So uh, over to you, Peter. So thank you, Tim. So uh, and uh, thank you also, Tyler, for setting it up so well to uh, get started here. So, you know, as Tim mentioned, I am the author of a book on this subject and I run a, a weekly podcast on the subject. Uh, so I encourage you to check it out if anything I say is of interest. So here are some key takeaways. 
Great power competition is likely to impact your future and your children's future, whether or not you live in a first or second rate nation, whether or not you live in a free or controlled world. The central competition is over space resources and the space means of production, by which I mean the moon and asteroids and their resources for in-space manufacturing. China is moving aggressively to shape this future and the US must lead or live in a future shaped by China. And you have personal agency to help decide our collective fate. So I'm gonna talk this in a series of 10 hard proofs. So the first one is, we are in a new era of strategic competition. And the, and the image I like the most here is the one on the right, because I really think it's a long-term contest of strength and endurance rather than something that's going to end up in actual fighting. But it's important to realize that this strategic competition is across the board. It's in military, whether it be naval vessels, submarines, missiles, fighters, bombers, drones, and satellites. It's economic in terms of trade infrastructure, uh, trade agreements and global infrastructure. It's diplomatic in terms of alternate governance and seats across the board in attempting to garner votes in the United Nation. It's coalitional based on projects and loans. And it is control of the future means of the economy, the means of production and transportation, meaning global infrastructure, ICT technology, 5G, artificial intelligence, surveillance technology, vehicles, as well as the control of critical things such as rare earth minerals and the flow of, uh, of critical energy resources. Hard truth number three is that it is in fact based on some level of adversarial and enmity. So there are numerous books, I've put up some of them that establish how deep within the PRC society their suspicion and dislike of our way of doing things and their desire to replace our order with something that is more comfortable to them and its strategic consequences for us. And I would point out that some of these are extremely credible authors. Michael Pillsbury is among you know, the, the, the most respected China watchers. General Spaulding you know, returned fairly recently from being the defense attache in Beijing. And Jonathan Ward's book is just fantastic. All right, and then we have to face the reality that uh, our competitor is extremely well resourced. That when it comes to uh, um, purchasing power parity, China's economy is already larger, and they're projected to be larger than us, you know, in just a few years in terms of uh, absolute GDP. Now, the next hard truth is that space is a central and perhaps the central theater uh, to the new great game. And that's the subject of, of the book that I mentioned. So let's talk a little bit about the geostrategic importance of space resources. So nations care a lot about relative power and they pay particular attention to relative economic growth. So, you know, typically when people attempt to rank great powers, they're concerned with the size of population and territory, resource endowment, economic capability, military strength, and they care about production in terms of land, labor, capital, tools, and energy. And the bottom line is that the resources of the solar system offer states the opportunity to, to change all of these, including the size of their population and territory, their resource endowment, their economic capability, and as a result, their military strength. So just to you know, give you a scale for what I'm gonna tell you next, the whole world GDP is about hundred trillion and the United States is about a fifth that, just under 20 trillion and our debt is about the same. Uh, you know, our federal budget is just under four trillion and our defense budget is under one. The largest market capitalization of Apple was one trillion and the richest person is about 160 trillion. And we have about 8 billion people on the planet and use about 18 terawatts of all forms of energy. Now, space is certainly expected to grow from approximately 400 billion today uh, to 2050 estimates of about 3 trillion on our side. And China is expecting about three times that of $10 trillion. But these estimates really don't account for, and space research just dwarf these uh, estimates. So, an individual asteroid can vastly exceed $1 trillion in terms of its current 
market value, meaning that if you were to try to get the resources that are contained in one, you would have to spend that amount at today's uh, prices. And one, this one pictured here at right, which is one of the smaller asteroids in its class, is estimated to contain about 20 trillion worth of, of valuable minerals. And that is bigger than the gross domestic product of Japan, Germany, the UK, France, and India combined. <laughs> 200 times more than all the gold mined in the California gold rush. <laughs> Just a moment here. So there are 830 asteroids valued in excess of $1 trillion. At least 500 of those valued in excess of $100 trillion. And the largest 16 psyche, over $10,000 quadrillion. There's also the possibility to increase living space. The asteroids contain sufficient material to build over 3,000 times the livable surface area of Earth, and the asteroid belt could support a population of 10 million billion people, depending only on the sun for power. So the energy wealth is you know, just enormous. As I mentioned today, we use about 18 trillion for all human civilization. Much more than that strikes the disk of the earth and incredibly amount more comes out of the sun. And if we were to do what I'm gonna tell you about what the PRC is trying to do, there are about 331 terawatts of electrical power and geostationary orbit alone that could be delivered by solar power satellites which would completely eliminate climate change several times over. And it means a much larger global product that a uh, trillion dollars of electric power supports approximately, sorry, one terawatt supports approximately $42 trillion of economic productivity. So that uh, exploiting just the resource in geo would mean 166 times larger global GDP. This is all going to be made possible by in-space manufacturing that allows us to construct very large things from space resources in space, as well as very, very large habitats eventually. And this is the infrastructure that both sides are starting to nip at <coughs> with their very nascent programs. But it is an exponential process which will lead to as big a change as we had in the first industrial revolution and a massive return on investment as we exploited the new world. So this leads to a competitive vision of how do you enable this space mining in order to build the green energy system of tomorrow. And we're facing a similar sort of time as when the United States was competing with other powers for the Pacific in terms of how we established the chain of islands that led to what eventually became a tremendous amount of trade across the Pacific. And here is sort of a picture of the developing space lines of commerce between the earth and the moon uh, and the flow of material that like across the Pacific is going to make a big difference with a vision of what we expect the cislunar economy to initially develop, as well as the sorts of government things that are going to need to be provided in order to make use of all that. Now, the hard truth number six is that we are in a new space race, though it's really more of a scramble and a struggle than a race. And it's important to understand just how broad and incredible what China is doing in this. So just in the past year, they successfully landed on the South Pole and the moon, pulled a lunar sample, brought that lunar sample back to Earth, a very complex procedure. They got into Mars orbit, succeeded in landing, succeeded in putting out a rover and taking this selfie at the bottom, and of launching and constructing their initial space station and putting on their first long duration crew. <coughs> for six months. Now, they're also attempting to attack satellites and there are a lot of ways to attack satellites. 
China is basically working down the list. So of course, in 2007, they did their first direct anti-satellite missile, which they've since deployed. They've tested it all the way up to geostationary orbit. They are working on co-orbital anti-satellite uh, uh, capabilities of which they have just launched another one with claims that they can melt a satellite on orbit. They are working on uh, lasers against satellites. They have uh, been implicated in hacking of the United States satellites. They are working on space to ground attack uh, vehicles and, uh, and missiles as you saw just tested with the fractional orbital bombardment system and uh, trans uh, atmospheric vehicles um, as a fast follower to what we're doing in SpaceX. So they are both fast following. There's the espionage uh, threat and the, and the leads that we think we have are likely to evaporate quickly. They're contesting across the board, global standards and services, including their alternative to GPS that they have linked into their One Belt, One Road, their space information corridor, which is linked to the One Belt, One Road to provide space services and lock countries in to their country champions uh, and, and their uh, ICT infrastructure. They're contesting diplomatically. Uh, they are opening up their space station to all nations of the world to provide and host uh, scientific experiments. They do capacity building with developing nations. They have released a roadmap with Russia for what they call an international lunar research station. That's, that's quite, uh, um, quite well thought out uh, and quite ambitious. They're working on in-space nuclear power and propulsion. They're working on kilometer scale ultra-large spacecraft. And they are working very specifically on space solar power. They have the most advanced and well-financed space solar power program uh, there, which is the future technology um, for energy. And they are looking to capture the means of production. They want to go after asteroids. They want to be able to deflect asteroids. And they're very interested in occupying strategic uh, terrain, as well as accelerating their ability to go back to the moon with humans and to have a permanent base in the 2030s. They're also contesting prestige at the highest level, releasing a roadmap for their for Mars human exploration. And, and so, you know, the hard truth number seven is what they're doing is not about propaganda. This is uh, this is about hard power, economic heft, the ability to coerce and to contest the U.S.-led order by every means available. It's kind of like you know the Maoist concept of a people's war, where you are. Uh, providing alternate governance structure, slowly working your way up till you have the means to directly challenge. And so China's leadership has invested very significant reputational capital in public announcements, both with domestic and international consequences, and they have an astounding record of meeting their announced space goals, which my co-author, Dr. Namrata Goswami, has documented at quite some length. All right. And the final hard proof, the United States must either lead or kowtow that, you know, as you heard from Tyler, post-World War II, the United States set up a range of institutions to allow this. So importantly, we set up NATO for defense. We set up the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the Marshall Plan, which essentially built the developed world. We set up the World Bank, the IMF, put the dollar as the reserve currency, enabling the financing and the control of financing to our preferences. We set up the norms of freedom of overflight in the International Civil Aviation Organization. And domestically, we set up NASA, DARPA, the Air Force, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Airport Commission, the Eisenhower Highway System that allowed us to develop infrastructure that was critical to economic growth at that time. The time that we're faced with now is to build the kind of economic means of production in space and to access and protect our access to resources that are going to make this possible for us and our children going forward. So the bottom line is that we either make a new international order in space or we will be forced to follow 
what China sets up because of their extremely strong initiative in going about this. And if you're interested in like, what is a get well plan? Uh, the, uh, the US Space Force, Air Force Research Lab and Defense Innovation Unit just pulled the, the sort of the titans the, uh, of the space industrial world. And they're about to release uh, within uh, the month, the state of the space industrial base 2021, which has a, a, an extremely comprehensive set of recommendations of where the United States needs to go. And that's my final slide. Thank you very much. Oh, I should just say, if you're interested, there's, there's the book where I go into all these things in tremendous uh, depth. That's it. Thank you, Peter. That was uh, a, a great overview of where we're at, um, what is coming, whether we like it or not, um, in many cases. And a lot of these points that you made and the parallels you drew look very similar to the 1930s when a lot of pundits, a lot of policymakers are saying, we've got our own problems at home. Don't worry about those weirdos in Europe that have great uniforms and funny armbands. Um, and before we know it, we're embroiled in a worldwide conflict because steps that we could have taken earlier were taken too late. Um, and all these institutions we've talked about were set up to prevent the next iteration of that. And um, now we're left with a system that maybe won't prevent the next conflict because it's not designed to do that for space. Um, and so I wanna talk now about that very fact that what we have isn't designed for space um, and what is it that we need and how can we um, do that um, without needing to have or wait for the next global war um, and rebuild out of that. So wanna, um, you know, as you've heard here, the global international order that has existed for the better part of a hundred years is fragile, it's under threat um, from a wide range of actors, internal and external. Um, and it's ultimately not designed for use in a new environment where space has uh, no international treaties, the rules of the road aren't set, and there is a uh, almost borderless expanse where anything that happens in space affects the earth and we have no mechanism to ensure that countries play by rules. And so um, when we in the foreign policy community talk about these, these things, we're, we're talking about how geography, economics, uh, and demography affect what we do and how we do it in space. And so you've heard about how the effects of um, economics were shaped by what the US created after World War II, how uh, security was influenced by institutions that were set up. And this was, we were able to do this as a nation because we had the combination of a secure bastion away from the fighting that was undamaged post-World War II. We had an economy that had been tooled for mass industrial production of war materials that could then be rapidly retooled to produce the goods the world needed to rebuild. And we had a population that was nearly perfectly aged to ensure decades of productivity growth um, and that combination is what ensured that the U.S. was able to not only create these institutions, but preserve them over the decades. And so when we look at space, um, the geography of space is very different. Um, we have the high ground, so to speak, being things as simple as low Earth orbit. 
Um, and there's a number of articles and other papers that Peter has written about the high ground in space and the threat uh, from malign actors there. But that's something that needs to be considered that no longer can the US count on our geography and oceans separating us from conflicts abroad. No longer can we count on our economic position providing us a buffer and a runway to develop an industrial base to fight a future war. Because in space, as you heard, there's trillions of dollars of resources on single asteroids floating near to Earth. And while our demography remains one of the strongest in the world, we now have to contend with the fact that we are competing with a country that is has the largest population in the world and a plan for how to use that and deploy them uh, to ensure their place in a new international order. So right now in space, the US has two primary tools that uh, we deploy. We have NASA, which is statutorily mandated to discover the new, to push the bounds of what's possible and drive the advance of space technology. In many ways, the NASA is meant to be and does very well um, the leadership in scientific innovation around space. Um, and that's their purpose. We've begun to think of NASA as everything in space that doesn't wear a uniform. And so when we hear hotels in space, we hear gas stations in space. NASA is immediately associated with that, but we don't, in, don't have that same framework on the ground when we think gas stations on the ground equals MIT. And so there's that missing link between the mundane, boring parts of life and NASA's mission and purpose. Space Force, the, the newer, player for the US government in space is meant to be that guarantor of US national security in space, to be the organization that protects our interest, deters aggression. Um, and if there's one thing the US military uh, does well, it's doing what it's told. And so while there's a lot of excitement about Space Force taking on missions that NASA may not be uh, well suited for or uh, desire to do. Uh, anything that involves building, creating, making, the military is not the institution for that. They are trained and honed to a fine point to defend, to fight, uh, and to project power. And so, um, expecting them to do the construction work uh, and the labor involved in uh, new institution creation would be to ensure that they are set up to fail at both missions. And so what's missing, as we saw uh, when Tyler was talking about the types of institutions implemented uh, after World War II, we're missing those organizations that can promote financial stability when we look into space, whether it's commodities exchanges, uh, a international monetary fund equivalent to ensure that there is a stable base for investments uh, in, in space. Uh, laws are required, be they property rights uh, or others. Um, and those, those are missing economic development organizations like the World Bank to ensure that the handful of space players that exist now are not the ones that can monopolize all of the benefits of space, but that we can ensure we pull the rest of humanity with us and that truly all boats may rise with the benefits of space and the abundance of resources there. And there's no organization or entity that has the responsibility or mandate to develop infrastructure to ensure that the access to the movement through and the 
economy of space is accessible. A quote I like to uh, give is uh, when Jeff Bezos uh, talked about how he didn't build Amazon on his own. Uh, he was able to found Amazon and make it successful because someone else had built the roads, established the postal service, um, and given him those backbone pieces that people didn't necessarily think about, but that ultimately were the deciding factor in whether Amazon would be a success as a company. And so when we look to space, we need to examine what are those pieces of infrastructure that don't exist now that can enable the Amazons and uh, like for space those basic pieces that once built, we will likely forget are even impressive. We do that because while these discussions about infrastructure, and if you're in the DC area listening right now, uh, infrastructure has been a theme now for the better part of a year, uh, and it's discussed as an absolute good. Uh, infrastructure is important, it's useful, uh, and it pays dividends. And all of that is true. And it's our assertion that space infrastructure particularly returns far more than ground site infrastructure in terms of a dollar to dollar comparison. And that's because ultimately uh, the construction of infrastructure in an entirely new domain of economic activity ensures that there is far more economic activity possible than the refurbishment of existing infrastructure. And we like to give an example of GPS uh, to talk about how the scale of return that's possible for some basic components, uh, in this case, navigation and timing of space infrastructure um, being able to dramatically change the course of the US economy. And so one of the policy options that is currently circulating around uh, the Hill right now is the Space Corporation. Uh, this is the bill, the Space Corporation Act of 2021 would create an infrastructure development corporation with a mandate to develop civil infrastructure for space. This corporation would seek to um, leverage the partnerships across government and internationally to ensure that any money spent was spent wisely and um, leveraged to the maximum extent possible um, with those partnerships and cooperations. But ultimately it would be designed to ensure that the roads and rails, the sewers and power equivalents in space have a mechanism to fund their creation. And it would do that um, and seek to expand employment in the space economy nationwide. Our economic analysis uh, suggests uh, something on the order of 2.5 million new high paying jobs would be created in the first 10 years of this organization's life. It would ease access to capital by buying down the risk for institutional investors and pension funds to be able to deploy those trillions of dollars of capital that exist in the US economic system uh, that right now sit on the sidelines of space. And right now we have a handful of high net worth individuals and venture capital firms that provide nearly all of the capital for the space economy. And one of the most important components of this new organization, like the Bretton Woods Institutes of past, is it would reduce the political uncertainty involved in access to capital. Instead of requiring constant appropriations or uh, returns to legislatures for new money, the Space Corporation would allow for a steady stream of investment by leveraging federal loan guarantees and bonding authority, so that way no new federal appropriations were needed. Ultimately though, uh, 
the space corporation is meant to be just the start, just like many of the institutions that grew out of Bretton Woods, evolved over time from national ones to international ones. The space corporation is meant to be a model for new institutions that can help restore the benefits and promise of global integration and promote international economic cooperation in space. Because as we've heard, whether we like it or not, there is a competition for space. And the basic physics of it means those who control the high ground in space will have the ability to choose the time and place of a conflict in the future with almost absolute impunity. And so as we look to the future and make those comparisons to the Cold War and the competition with the Soviets, the US didn't beat the Soviet Union by training an army to go head to head with mass waves of infantry like the Russians were able to deploy. We didn't retool our entire economic system to be state led to compete with their five year plans and economic centralization. Instead, we realized that our strengths lie in the merger of Wall Street, Main Street, and Silicon Valley, when we can bring the capital markets of the West, combine that with the innovation of Silicon Valley and the productivity of the American worker, we outcompeted the Soviets without playing their game. Now, as we look to China, we have a similar situation between central economic planning mass amounts of workers and a military that is one of the largest in the world. We can try to compete at their game. We can try to scale economic and industrial capability, or we can recognize that our strengths lie in avoiding that conflict and competing on our own terms. So I'd like to close it there. Um, and open it for questions. Uh, several of you have already um, put in questions. You can tweet them to us uh, at F4F Space uh, on our Facebook page, F4F Space. Um, but we'll get started here real quick. Uh, Tyler, for you, the question that came up was, um, why should we have a US international order? Um, over the past decades, we have seen this international order cause harm, uh, not live up to its promise in many instances. And so is it truly a good thing to perpetuate this um, or does it cause more harm than good? Well, I would agree that it's definitely caused harm, but as we've seen with the events that led to World War I and World War II, the opposite of order is chaos. So in the absence of the US-led international order, I think the, the other alternative right now is chaos because there's no other country that has the power or even the, the will to take, up, take our mantle. China may be, may be the closest in power, but I don't think they have any desire to do so. And also they're not a democratic nation. So why would we want them to take over our mantle? Yeah, I think that's a good point that um, if we don't lead, someone will. Um, Peter, did you want to weigh in on that as well? Well, I think, you know, certainly we have to be humble about the fact that uh, the order we set up has not been perfect, even against its own uh, uh, stated norms and values. But we can't lose sight of just how incredible a change this was, as you laid out prior to the establishment of this order, it was a much, much worse, less stable world for almost all citizens. And it's also important to recognize that before we set up this world, um, the vast majority of states were not democracies. They did not have you know, uh, human rights enshrined. The, these very ideas of liberty and democracy that seem so universal, you know, um, we should be very skeptical that those would persist if the top power um, is an autocracy. That you know that security community um, that we take for granted 
um, you know, if that collapses, we really do face a return, you know, not to a, you know, a multilateral world that might look very similar to today, but really to, you know, a bunch of closed economic empires where regional autocratic powers dictate to others how things work. Yeah, I think uh, we tend to forget because the vast majority of us have never known otherwise uh, that internationally we seem to regress to uh, this chaotic autocracy um, where not only uh, is there not a respect for international norms and human rights, but respect for rules in general, uh, the might mighty take what they can uh, and the weak endure what they must. Um, the second question um, that has come in, uh, starting with you, Peter, uh, was, I think this keyed in on one of the slides uh, where you're talking about um, hypersonics. Uh, so the question was, in the Cold War, there was a lot of hype about the missile gap, about how the Soviet Union was pulling ahead. They were winning in the defense uh, battle. And we later find out not quite as bad as it was portrayed. Um, and so is there a similar situation going on now where there's, you know, maybe China's a threat, but it's not as bad as we think because most of what they're talking about is propaganda or hype? Well, you know, look, this is a bit of a Pascal's wager or gamble because, you know, obviously you always need to be skeptical of your intelligence and your bias. Um, and that can lead you to, you know, overspend resources when you don't need to. But on the other hand, you know, you have to honor the fact uh, that your opponent might get the upper hand. And, and what does that mean for you? And do you want to take the chance of putting yourself in a position, you know, where you are, uh, it, just where you're not optimally positioned. So, you know, the, you know, I, I tend to, in my own thinking on this, you know, adopt a, a risk-based approach. And I prefer to, you know, err on the side of caution because the consequences, the negative consequences are so high and you really only get one shot. So, you know, yes, you face the possibility of somewhat of a, you know, of a spiral in an arms race, but a spiral in an arms race is mostly just a, a you know, a, an economic cost to your overall, you know, productivity. Um, it, you know, it, arms races, there's, there's not strong evidence that arms races result in war. They are a third option, you know, rather than kowtow, if you can't come to an agreement, um, you want to make war impossible so that you can, you know, continue through deterrence so that you can continue to move forward. And so, you know, in my view, you know, uh, an arms race uh, is per perhaps the best policy option you have in order to preserve the peace and the, the sort of world order that you want. Um, I, you know, so in my view, I think, you know, you have to honor the intelligence that the threat is is real until proven otherwise. And if that happens, great. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point that uh, while there are costs for an arms buildup, um, it uh, pales in comparison to the alternative. And I, I do think, you know, in many ways, space is a little bit different because we can see a lot more of what is happening. Um, in Russia, you can, shuffle around missile launchers and, and jet fighters. It's a lot harder to hide the fact that you're building a station in low earth orbit right now. Um, so uh, there is that sort of verification that's possible. Uh, did you wanna weigh in on that, Tyler? Yeah, so it's, <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize the threat from China, whether it's inflated or not. But looking at not so much the arms race, but but the space race, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary to use fear of China as a motivating factor, because as we've seen from what Peter presented, expanding the space economy has nothing but benefits for the United States and whoever is involved. So why why are we just now 
wanted to expand space because we're afraid that China is going to get there before we do. We, we should already have been done this, been doing this stuff for, for decades. Yeah, I think that's an important point and a great one to close on that whether or not we're competing with China militarily, the economic benefits of space are such that we are far better off expanding into space and then just having a military to secure that economic gain uh, than sitting on the sidelines and setting, letting someone else sort of South China see us out of space. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I would just like to add that in my perspective, you know, the, the primary threat to the United States interest is not uh, tactical space weapons. It, it is the strategic control of the means of production and the resources that provide, you know, the, the wellspring of all national power, economic as well as military. And it is a, it's a mistake to focus on, you know, the, on space weapons when the real competition is really over the, the future of wealth and freedom. Yeah, I think that's, that's important to note. Um, and, you know, that's been played out a number of times throughout human history that control of the resources and means of production um, is what wars are fought over and what decides the futures of civilizations. So I think with that, uh, we'll wrap up. We've not uh, gotten any more questions in. So I wanna thank you both for your time. This has been phenomenal. Uh, again, for those of you uh, listening out there, we will uh, post the links uh, in the descriptions for the books uh, and where you can find out more. But uh, thank you both for your time and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim.